Hey there YouTube, Jack Delora of Audio Tech VR here. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing one of my all-time favorite keyboards, the Fender Rhodes Electric Piano. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, what can be said about the Rhodes that hasn't been said already? When I started searching for video reviews of the Rhodes, I found that there's not really anything out there. There's no comprehensive look at the Rhodes Electric Piano. So I'm hoping that this video review will give you a closer look at what it's like to play, own, and maintain a Rhodes Electric Piano, and to give you some tips that I've picked up along the way. So here's an overview of what I'm going to cover in this video. Number one, a quick background and history of the instrument, including some of the models that were available. Number two, how the Fender Rhodes works. Number three, what makes the Fender Rhodes stand out from other keyboard instruments. Number four, some notable users and notable songs that was played on. Number five, some common effects pedals used with the Rhodes. Number six, how I got my Rhodes. Number seven, some comments I have on ownership and maintenance. And number eight, some buying tips I have for people looking to purchase one. Okay guys, before I get this review going, I wanted to let you guys know that there is going to be a lot of talking in this video. So if you're just here to hear what the road sounds like, I'm gonna put some links below that'll let you skip between the different sections. And um, if you're tired of me talking, just feel free to skip to the next section. Also, if you're here to see the roads mainly played through effects, I'm only gonna do a small demonstration of multiple effects that I have. But I am going to make a separate video that um, goes more in depth with the effects that I have and some that my friend has. So if that's what you're here for, this will give you a small taste, but there will be more to come. Part one, a quick history of the roads, uh, a list of some of the models available and a look at the main parts of the instrument. So before we get started. Uh, with the background of the Rhodes, I wanted to go over some of the main parts of the instrument so that you can have a basic understanding of what I'm talking about when I mention the different parts that make up the Rhodes. So we're going to start off with the differences between the two basic models of the Rhodes. So this is my amateur sketch of the two basic models of the Rhodes that were available. The original version was the suitcase, which as you can sort of make out has a big amplifier cabinet that sits underneath of it. And then later in its production life, the stage piano was introduced, which does not have a speaker cabinet. It has detachable legs and an external sustain pedal. I should mention that the suitcase has a built-in sustain pedal in the amplifier case. Okay guys, so now we're gonna go over the exterior of the roads. I have a stage model, so not everything I say will be applicable to the suitcase, but I'll let you know the differences when I get to those parts. So starting on the top, this big black plastic cover is called the harp cover, and you can pull this off, and underneath is the interior action of the instrument, which we'll get to in the next section of this part. This big metal piece across the front is called the name rail, and it has your basic tone controls, which on the stage model were limited to just bass boost and volume unless you had an optional or aftermarket um, preamp. And in the suitcase model pianos, uh, they had an extra control for vibrato and depending on the year of the piano that you're looking at, you might have a different set of controls. The first set of controls had three knobs which were concentric and had the vibrato control. And then the later models had an effects send here, and then two sliders for the tone control, and then two knobs and a switch for the vibrato. Um, the other parts of the exterior, this is just your typical piano key bed. I wanted to mention that the vinyl covering all over the wooden parts of the instrument is just typical Tolex, which is used on guitar amps and other things. Um, on the stage piano, you have some big removable chrome legs which can be stored away for um, transporting the instrument. It also has a removable sustain pedal here and the difference on the suitcase is that you'll have a big huge amp cabinet um, which will have a built-in sustain pedal and then two metal supports and that's really about it. The, the uh, only other thing that it comes with is a big suitcase top which is looks like a big like wooden road case cover for the top of the instrument and on the stage model you can store the um, legs and the sustain pedal in it and on the suitcase it's just a cover so that's about it for the exterior of the instrument now we're going to take a look at the inside 
Okay, so I wanted to give you a quick look underneath the instrument. Um, these metal parts right here that connect to the rear legs are the leg braces for the instrument. Um, they're pretty commonly lost. In fact, my first stage piano did not come with them. And you have this little um, piece here that you use to screw them onto the um, body of the instrument. Uh, the suitcase piano does not have this part at all as it just sits on the amplifier. And I also wanted to give you a closer look at my aftermarket sustain pedal. And um, the original sustain pedal for the Rhodes, pretty much I think all of the stage models uh, was made of metal and it was a silver color on the earlier versions. Mine is just made of plastic. So this is a look at the inside of the Rhodes piano, what the action consists of. This is the other end of your key that you don't see that's on the inside of the piano. Here's your hammer, which strikes the tine. The tine is the basic tone production uh, element of the Rhodes. Think of it like a piano string. It vibrates, which uh, creates the sound of the Rhodes. The tone bar up top is basically used in conjunction with the tine to create a loud enough output to be picked up by the pickup. And these two resonate together and output electromagnetic waves, which are then output through all the pickups. Um, you also have a damper, which is exactly the same as your typical piano damper, although it is obviously much simpler, similar to the action as a whole. And just like in a real piano, it will dampen the note when you're not playing it. Um, the sustain pedal, which I don't have on here, but works by pulling down all the dampers and letting the notes sustain until you let go of the pedal. Another unique aspect of the Rhodes is the tuning spring on the tine, and this is just used to fine-tune each note a couple of cents. Um, and then over here you have two mounting screws, which I forgot to mention, but the entire wood piece that all of the tines and pickups sit on is called the harp. And these two mounting screws mount each tone bar to the harp. The uh, rubber pieces, which I'll show you in a minute on the real instrument, um, that come between the screw and the tine, or the tone bar, I mean, are called the grommets. Um, so that's really about it for the interior of the instrument. Um, some of the earlier models used slightly different design for the tone bar and tine, and also the hammers originally were felt covered. Eventually they were changed to the more common plastic and rubber combination, which was much more durable. Um, but the basic design of the thing really didn't change a whole lot over the production span other than the materials. Okay guys, so this is the inside of the roads with the harp cover off. These long metal pieces here you see are the tone bars and then the very thin, almost wire-like metal pieces are the tines. This is the tuning spring I was mentioning and then all these pink metal and plastic pieces are the pickups. Your output is just a typical RCA jack, which is then routed through the front here, through your tone controls, and then out to your amp. Um, the white piece you see moving here, the felt, is the damper, and then you can see the rubber-tipped hammer coming up to strike the tine at the same time. Um, the whole assembly, this whole top part here, is called the harp, and then a part that I couldn't show you in my little side view drawing was this part here. This is the harp support and like the name, all it does is support the harp. On my later model, it's made of aluminum, but on the earlier ones, it was made of wood. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you before I put the top back on is what the uh, dampers look like when you push down the sustain pedal. So when you do that, it just brings down all the dampers at the same time, so you can have full sustain for all the notes. And then once you let go of the pedal, it just brings it back up and dampens all the notes. So. That's about it. It's a fairly simple system and a pretty genius design, at least I think so. So this should give you a pretty good idea of the main parts that make up a Rhodes. Now we're going to get into some of the basic history of the instrument and a list of some of the models that were offered over the production life. The Rhodes electric piano was the invention of Harold Rhodes, who was a piano teacher in California. He worked on several prototypes of the instrument before taking his idea to Leo Fender in hopes of bringing it to the mass market. Initially, it was only available as a 32-note bass piano, which was meant to replace a bass player in a band. 
but by 1965, a full-size version of the Rhodes was made available. And these full-size versions of the Rhodes are going to be the focus of this review. Over the life of the instrument, various improvements were made, and by the early 1980s, some cost-cutting measures and cheapening of materials put the quality of the instrument in jeopardy. Due to the success and overwhelming popularity of cheap polysynths, such as the Yamaha DX7, the Rhodes electric piano was eventually discontinued by the mid-80s. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a quick overview of the various Rhodes model years. So from 1965 to 1969, the Sparkle Top Rhodes was available. And this was the first of the full-size Rhodes instruments that was ever produced. It uh, had a very different action from the later versions of the instrument. Um, the hammers were actually felt-covered, uh, similar to those in an acoustic piano, actually. And the tone bar, tine, and pickup designs were very different from later instruments. So it has a very unique tone to it. And you can hear examples of this on uh, Miles Davis's records from the late 60s, like Bitches Brew. Um, it also had wooden harp supports and mono vibrato on the original uh, version of the instrument. And eventually it was upgraded to stereo vibrato as found in all the later suitcase variants. Um, but the sparkle top name actually comes from the fact that it had a sparkly silver harp cover which uh, this was only available during the 1965 to 1969 model years of the instrument. Then in 1969, the Fender Rhodes Mark I was introduced, and this was the first year that the stage piano was offered, so now you had a choice between suitcase or stage. And they also got rid of the sparkly silver harp cover from the sparkle top years. Initially, the internal mechanisms of the instrument were exactly the same as those from the sparkle top, meaning that it had the uh, felt covered hammers, different tine and tone bars and pickups. Um, but very shortly into the production life, they were all changed out for the better setup of the uh, hybrid wood and plastic hammers with replaceable rubber tips um, and updated tine and tone bar design so that they lasted longer and produced a more even tone and then of course new pickups as well. Um, these models had the wooden harp supports as well and uh, the 88 key was actually introduced during these model years. It was first available in 1972. Okay then in 1975 the Rhodes Mark I was introduced and initially it was just a change in name. The internals were exactly the same um, but by late 1975 they had changed the design once again uh, now the hammers were fully plastic, still with the same rubber tips, and the harp supports were changed from wood to aluminum. Also, um, by 1977, the original three-knob uh, preamp for the suitcase was changed over to a new version, which had sliders and effects loop and um, different vibrato controls. And the amplifier system was also updated to be more powerful as well. And then another thing that I'm going to get into in a second here is that they changed the action of the instrument around the same time that they updated the suitcase, around 1977-78. And they added something called a pedestal bump. And I'm going to give you a quick look at what that means in just a moment. Then in 1979, the Rhodes Mark II was introduced. Initially, it was just a cosmetic change from the Rhodes Mark I. It featured a new flat harp cover, which enabled people to finally stack another keyboard on top of the instrument, and the uh, name rail was also updated to include a larger music stand. Um, in 1980, a 54 key version of the Rhodes was introduced. And then um, around the same time, they started to cheapen the materials that the instrument was made out of. They changed the initially wood core keys for fully plastic ones and the metal key pins that hold the keys in place and let them move were replaced with plastic ones which are known to break. Um, also the pickups were changed for the infamous white tape pickups which are known to go bad over time as well. Um, and then this instrument was finally discontinued in 1982. Um, then the Rhodes Mark V was introduced in 1984 and this basically came about because Harold Rhodes uh, was not happy with the lack of quality in the uh, later Mark II's so basically he took the instrument back to the drawing board and completely redesigned and re-engineered the whole thing so now instead of the original wood 
casing with some plastic and, and other wood parts in the action, it had a fully plastic casing, which made it a lot lighter and easier to transport. They also completely redesigned the action so that the hammers actually had a longer travel distance, which made the instrument more dynamic. And they also replaced the um, inferior plastic core keys of the Rhodes Mark II with the original wood core keys found in earlier instruments. Um, so I don't have a date for the end of production for that instrument because I couldn't find too much information about when they stopped making it, but I know that it was introduced in 84. Um, so that's it as far as the most common variants of the roads go. All right, so while I've got my little diagram up here, I wanted to tell you guys which roads I'm specifically covering in this review. So due to the um, low production numbers of the Mark V and the Sparkle Top, and the fact that I have no personal first-hand experience with them, I'm not going to be including them in this review. And that also goes for the earlier version of the Fender Rhodes Mark I with the felt tip hammers and the different uh, tie and tone bar and pickup designs. Um, basically, what I'm covering in this video is the most common versions of the Rhodes. And that, those include the later version of the Mark I, produced after about 1970 or 71, all versions of the Rhodes Mark I, and then the early versions of the Rhodes Mark II. Um, I figure that most people that are in the market for a Rhodes are going to be finding these instruments, and um, I just wanted to let you know that if you're looking for information on these rarer versions of the instrument, that it's not going to be found in this review. So I just thought I'd let you know that up front. So before I move on to part two, I wanted to do a quick section of clarification and recap. Um, up on the screen now, I've got a list of what I'm covering in this review. And there's three different models of the Rhodes that I'm covering. These include the 71 to 74 Fender Rhodes Mark I, the 75 to 79 Rhodes Mark I, and the 79 to early 80s Rhodes Mark II. Um, the numbers to the right of the names are the different key amounts that they were available in over their production and I wanted to mention uh, first of all that the 88 key version was not available until 1972 and it was introduced during the Fender Rhodes era um, and then you can also see that there's a 54 there and there was a 54 key stage piano that was introduced in 1980 during the Rhodes Mark II's production. Um, so I should mention that the 73 and 88 key uh, versions of all the ones I have up on the screen right now were available as stage or suitcase versions, and like I said, the 54 was only a stage. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is that the reason why I have early 80s listed for the last years of the Mark II that I'm covering is that um, around this time they changed to the uh, fully plastic key bed along with plastic key pins. and the white tape pickups and this combination is known for being somewhat inferior and less reliable and uh, I also don't have any first-hand experience with it so I'm not including it in this review so I'm only including the wood key bed version with the pink tape pickups so here's a quick look at the differences in the suitcase amplifiers that were available over the model years that are covered in this review from 71 to 76, the Peterson amp was available, and this was an 80-watt amp with stereo vibrato. And then in 1977, the amp was upgraded to the Janus amp, which had a more powerful 100-watt amplifier. Um, still had the stereo vibrato, but it now included an effects loop and line level outputs. So you could finally run effects uh, out of the suitcase amplifier, and it also had the line level outputs, which enabled you to record directly into your console, so you no longer needed to mic up the instrument. And there was also um, two outputs, which enabled you to output the stereo vibrato on two separate channels. One last thing before I move on to part two, I wanted to go over the differences in key pedestal designs. So uh, for those of you that don't know, the key pedestal in the Rhodes piano is the um, end of the key on the inside of the piano that sits directly under the hammer. So um, from 70 to around 1974, they had a version with a ramped front, and on the earlier models, it had a slightly curved rear portion, and then in 71, a flat top version was introduced um, while still retaining the ramped front. 
Then with the full redesign in 1975, where they added the uh, fully plastic hammers, the uh, key pedestal was also redesigned. And on the earlier versions with the ramped front, they had the felt on the actual key pedestal itself. And on the new 75 version, they took the felt and put it on the underside of the hammer. Um, so this made the action feel a little bit sloppy, spongy, some have called it. Um, I, I feel that it feels heavier than some of the other versions. And um, to uh, respond to the complaints that people had, they introduced a new version of the action in 1978. And as you can see, it has a sort of bump to it at the front section. Um, and this was basically a carryover from the sparkle top days of the instrument where they had a similar bump on the key pedestals. And um, it basically lightened up the action, made it um, easier to play, you can play fast runs better, and um, I think it feels a little bit nicer. But I wanted to mention that I've used both the 75 version and the 78 version, and although I think the 78 is better, my versions of the 75 were still playable. I didn't find them to be so terrible that I had to do something about it. But for those of you that feel that your action is so bad that you want to do something about it, there actually is something that you can do to modify it and make it play better. And essentially, it's adding that key pedestal bump to your instrument. Um, Vintage Vibe sells a kit that has a bunch of little plastic pieces that you glue onto the actual pedestal and then cover it with felt. And essentially, it accomplishes the same thing as the later redesign, and it makes your action play um, much nicer than before. So I just wanted to mention that in case you're not satisfied with your action, there is something that you can do about it. So that's it for part one. Uh, now we're going to move on to part two, uh, where I look at how the Rhodes works. Part two, how the Rhodes works. So using my amateur sketch here, I'm going to try and explain how the Rhodes works. It's a fairly simple and ingenious sound creation system. The action is somewhat similar to an acoustic piano, but much simpler. The back end of the key pushes up on the hammer, which is then brought up, and at the same time, the damper is brought down. Then the hammer strikes the tine, which causes it to resonate, and at the same time that that's resonating, the tone bar begins to resonate. The pickup, while all this is happening, is picking up the electromagnetic waves output by the combination of the tone bar and the tine. And then this is output to your amp. That's it. Pretty genius, right? The sustain pedal works just as it does in an acoustic piano. It brings down all the dampers and allows the notes to sustain as long as the pedal is held down. The length of the tine or tone bar defines the pitch of the note. And then the tuning spring here on the end of the tine is used to fine tune the note. The placement of the pickup changes the overall tone of the note. and depending on how far away it is from the tine, can be uh, balanced for more overtones or fundamental. Okay, so I wanted to show you what the Rhodes action looks like in action. So like I was saying, when you press a key, the damper is brought down and the hammer is brought up. And then if you hit the key hard enough, the hammer actually hits the tine and then causes it to vibrate, which then outputs the tone. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is similar to any normal piano, the damper is held down as long as you hold down the note. And then when you let go of the key, it'll return to its resting position. So that's how you get your varying note lengths. I know I mentioned this before, but um, when you push down the sustain pedal, as you can see, all the dampers are brought down. And this allows for all notes to be sustained as long as you want them to be. So that's about it for how the action works. Part three, what sets the Rhodes apart from other keyboards? Well, this is probably really obvious, but I think the main reason that the Rhodes has stuck around for as long as it has is the tone. The Rhodes has a very unique tone, and although I feel like we're getting closer to replicating it, I feel like there's no perfect representation of it, either in analog format or digital format. And so the only way that you can get the true Rhodes tone or sound is with the real deal. I also feel that the dynamic response and expressiveness of the instrument really make it fun to play. And because the tone can range from the soft, spacey vibe to the hard, distorted bark when you play it hard, uh, really lets it be able to be used in a wide variety of music. I've heard it in rock, pop, jazz, country, electronic music, ambient music, and uh, 
I, I think it's pretty impressive that this instrument with, you know, one tone uh, can be used widely. I think that really says something about the character of the tone that you can find it in all these different types of music. So I think another aspect that uh, makes it popular, especially today, is the simplicity of it. Um, you know, we're so used to our big workstation keyboards that have thousands and thousands of parameters that you can go in and fine tune your sound. And I think it's really appealing in this distraction filled era, something so simple with only limited control over the sound, you, it forces you to just have to sit down and play it, similar to an acoustic piano. It's, it's sort of a throwback, but it's also you get this analog connection to it because, you know, you don't have a lot to fiddle with, you just have to play. So I think that those two things really have led to it being used well into the 21st century and almost 30 years after it was originally discontinued. So um, I just thought I'd throw in my two cents before I start to go over some popular users and popular songs that was played on in part four. So, Part four, some notable users and notable tracks the Rhodes was played on. So like I said in the previous section, the Rhodes has been used on a huge amount of music since its introduction in the mid-1960s. Some notable players from the jazz fusion era were Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, and Joe Zawinul. And then in the jazz funk or jazz pop genres, you had Bob James, Donald Fagan of Steely Dan, and of course, Stevie Wonder. In more modern music, the Rhodes can be heard on many of Jamiroquai's tracks from the 90s and 2000s. And um, Daft Punk's most recent album had the Rhodes on many of the tracks. Uh, also, the Black Keys have been known to use it both in the studio and live. And then in the jazz scene, you have uh, Robert Glasper, who also uses it in studio and on stage. And then um, also Radiohead has used it live. I'm not sure if it was actually used on their albums, but I'm sure that it was probably in the studio at some point when they were recording. So it's been used in a lot of music, both vintage and modern. So um, now for those of you that have been waiting for me to actually play the thing, here we go. Um, I'm going to start off with a tune by Freddie Hubbard, which is called Red Clay. And Herbie Hancock, who I just mentioned, played the Rhodes on this track. Okay, so I moved the camera around a little bit, and like I said, now I'm going to play Red Clay by Freddie Hubbard. So that's just like the little main riff of the song. Uh, I thought it'd give you a good idea of what these big jazzy chords sound like on the instrument. And um, now I'm going to do the sort of breakdown solo section of the song. I'm just going to play the chord progression there too. And um, then we'll get on to some different music. Okay, so that was Bits and Pieces of Red Clay by Freddie Hubbard. And next I'm going to play for you a Bob James tune, which was famous in the 70s for being the theme song to the show Taxi, and this is called Angela.
All right, so that was Angela by Bob James. Okay, to sort of give you a different flavor now, I'm going to play uh, Reflections by Thelonious Monk, my own interpretation of it anyways. And um, this is just to show you what uh, different types of music that wasn't or, you know, known to be played on the roads that often sounds like. Um, so here it goes. <laughs> So you don't really hear that sort of traditional jazz played on here that often. It's more known for the fusion type stuff. So another famous player that I forgot to mention before is uh, Ray Manzarek of the Doors. And he was notable for not only playing the full-size Rhodes later in the Doors career, but also the uh, Rhodes piano bass uh, early on. He played this in conjunction with an organ. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of his more famous riffs and... Uh, let you hear how they sound on the roads. Uh, first of all, Riders on the Storm comes to mind. Um, also, from their earlier days, Light My Fire. And he also played the piano bass on other tracks like uh, Break On Through. Um, but uh, another, well, probably more cheesy track, but um, nonetheless hit from the 70s that I'm thinking of uh, off the top of my head was How Long by Ace. And this featured the Rhodes prominently as the lead, I guess, instrument on the track. And the um, progression goes something like this. To finish out this section, I'm going to do a short version of the riff from uh, Radiohead's Everything in Its Right Place, and I'm going to be sort of combining it with Robert Glasper's jazzy version of the song. Um, so, hope you like it, and after that, I'll be looking at the Rhodes run through some effects. So here. All right, so this is part five, the many moods of the roads, which is going to involve me putting the instrument through multiple uh, different effects pedals. And I'm going to start with a classic combination of the roads and the MXR Phase 90. 
and you've probably heard this on many records. I'm pretty sure this is what Donald Fagan uses for his roads. Um, and I'll try a couple different speed variations so you can hear how it sounds. At this sort of high rate, it sounds like the effect used on No Quarter by Led Zeppelin, which I don't know how to play, but I know it's something like this. So that was how it sounded through the MXR Phase 90. It gives you that sort of 70s spacey vibe to it. Um, now we're going to try it through the Diamond Trem pedal, which is a really nice tremolo pedal, um, which probably anybody who's familiar with has only heard it used with guitar, but we'll see how it sounds with the Rhodes. So one of the nice things about this pedal is that you can mess around with tap tempo. So it kind of mimics the sound of the uh, suitcase piano, although it's not in stereo, uh, but obviously it sounds really nice through that. Now I'm going to put it through the um, Space Echo reissue that he has here. Thank you. 
So as you can see and hear, it's a lot of fun to play through the delay. Um, I guess I can show you some of the uh, different distorted tones that we can get with this thing. Um, we'll start off with a fuzzy tone through the fuzz face. As you'll hear, it uh, actually almost picks up like the characteristic of a guitar sound when you play it through the fuzz. <laughs> So uh, you could almost mistake it for a guitar if you didn't know any better. Now we'll try it through the blues driver. So it gives it a more like muddy sounding, uh, almost like a tube distortion to it. Um, we'll try it through the OCD next. Alright, so you can hear that, that gives it a very thick distorted sound as well. Um, so I guess to close, I am just going to uh, mess around with the delay again because it's so much fun. We can try a slapback delay sound this time.
Right, guys so that's it for part five i wanted to reiterate something i said earlier in the video um, which is that i am going to be making a separate video that just focuses on the roads played through effects pedals and i'm going to be uh, using more than just the effects pedals you saw in this video so if your main purpose for watching this video was to see the roads played through some effects there will be a more in-depth look at that in a future video so i just wanted to reiterate that in case you missed it and part six will start in just a second part six how i got my roads so this is actually the third roads that i've owned um the first one i owned was a 1978 stage piano roads which i paid about 400 bucks for in around 2010 and that one was in pretty rough shape when I got it. It did not have the suitcase top, nor did it have the sustain pedal or the um, braces for the legs. And then um, in around 2011, 2012, I got a 1975 suitcase Rhodes. And again, it was in rough condition like the first one. And this one was actually missing the whole harp cover. And someone had modified the five pin DIN output of the preamp to two XLR cables for some reason. Um, eventually, I got rid of both of those because I felt that they weren't really um, good enough to restore or put any money into. And then um, 2012 came around and I was wanting another Rhodes again. So I had a Roland Juno 6, which was in pretty good shape. And um, I wasn't using it a whole lot. And I put up an ad and found somebody who was looking to trade this for my Juno 6 and I went out and looked at it and as you can see it's it was in really good shape I really haven't had to do a whole lot to it other than just basic cleaning and um, I don't know if I mentioned this before but this is a 1975 stage piano and it is actually late 1975 so it's after they uh, changed over from the hybrid wood plastic hammers to the fully plastic ones so it's not the most, I guess, desirable model, but um, I think it sounds great and it plays really nicely. And um, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I also forgot to mention that it did not come with a sustain pedal when I got it. So I did have to order a third party uh, sustain pedal from Vintage Vibe. But other than that, that was probably the most expensive thing I've had to do to the instrument. And um, it's been great other than that. So I just thought I'd give you a quick background on how I got my roads. 
Part seven, some comments I have on ownership and maintenance. Okay, so before I get this section started, I wanted to again stress that I am only talking about the Fender Rhodes Mark ones uh, after about 1970 or 71 that have the rubber tipped hammers, any of the Rhodes Mark ones, and then the early versions of the Rhodes Mark II. Um, and this is because these are the most common versions of the instrument and I do not have any experience with the Rhodes Mark V or the Sparkle Top Rhodes, so I don't want to be spreading any misinformation about them because I could, you know, steer somebody in the wrong direction. So, again, Fender Rhodes Mark I with rubber tip hammers, Rhodes Mark I, Rhodes Mark II. Um, so, I wanted to do this section to let people know what it's like to own a Rhodes. And um, I think out of all the vintage keyboard instruments that I've owned, the Rhodes is probably the most reliable and easiest to maintain. Um, I think one of the most positive things about owning a Rhodes is that the community um, around the Rhodes is huge. I mean, you've got companies even today that are producing brand new parts for the thing, along with uh, huge forums about the instrument and a wealth of information on how to service and maintain it. Um, there's companies like Vintage Vibe that have just about every single part of the instrument um, available as a replacement. So anything that goes wrong, you can pretty much find a backup part. And again, I'm specifically talking about those more common versions of the Rhodes. If you have one of the rarer versions, obviously the parts are going to be harder to find. But most of the parts that are available are for the Fender Rhodes Mark I, Rhodes Mark I, and Rhodes Mark II. Um, another thing... Sites like Vintage Vibe have provided an awesome thing for um, us YouTube people. They've made videos of the service for the instrument. So instead of just reading it, you can actually see what you have to do to maintain it. And I feel that that is awesome. Just to have a visual confirmation of how to do things is excellent because it just enables you to be able to work on the instrument even more. And... Um, They've also done an awesome thing where they have provided the original service manual for the instrument as a free PDF online. So basically anything that they don't have up as a video, you can find in that manual. And then, um, like I was saying, there's forums too. So basically any question you have, you could you know put it up on the forums and hope that someone will get back to you. And then Another thing is that Vintage Vibe has an email service that you can ask them questions as well, and they'll get back with you. And I've personally done this, and they have given me some information. So those are three things. I think with the you know the up and coming of the internet in the '90s, that really just made this instrument a lot easier to um, own and maintain because you have this huge source of information for it now that maybe. Back in the day, you would not have had. So um, another thing that I wanted to mention before I close this section is that I've owned three roads. And I have to say that um, the maintenance I've had to do on them is like very, very limited. Uh, the Even the ones that were in rough condition, uh, I literally just had to do some very simple cleaning. And um, they were pretty much up and running. And probably the most... Uh, difficult thing that I've ever had to do, which I would not call it difficult by any means, um, is changing a tine. And I know some people are probably worried, like, oh, is it going to break tines when I play? Out of the three that I've owned over the past four or five years, uh, I've only had one tine break. So, I mean, all the instruments were pretty close in age, and, you know, some had obviously been played more than others, but um, I think that the majority of the time this stuff is very reliable and um, if you're interested in seeing you know how uh, involved these maintenance jobs are just check out Vintage Vibes channel because like I was saying they have a full array of uh, videos on service and I don't want to keep plugging them but um, I know that there are other uh, people that have posted service videos as well so you could just you know, try searching around YouTube and hopefully you'll find some stuff that should answer your questions. Um, so that's really about it. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that 
uh, this instrument has been great, and if you're looking to buy one, I would not be too afraid of the maintenance. So, Part 8, Buying Tips. Okay, guys, so uh, before I get into this section, I wanted to give you guys my personal recommendation as to which uh, models of the roads you should be looking for. Uh, the ones that I recommend are the uh, Fender Rhodes Mark I after 1970 or 71 when they changed over to the rubber tip hammers, any of the Rhodes Mark I models, and then the earlier Rhodes Mark II models. The reason why I don't recommend the Sparkle Top Rhodes is because the parts are harder to find and you're going to have different issues. Since the hammers are felt covered like a piano, over time uh, they have a problem where they get grooves in them just from hitting the tines so many times. And you'll have to find somebody or possibly try to do it yourself who will file out the uh, hammers to make them uh, play the instrument better again. And basically, as the grooves get bigger, the tone is sort of deadened, and uh, it, it makes it, you know, sound worse. So I wouldn't recommend that one unless you're, you know, fully aware of those issues and still want one anyways. Um, also, the electronics are going to be a lot older in that, and I'm not sure how easy it is to find replacements for some of the uh, parts in that. Um, the reason why I don't recommend the later model Mark IIs is that they change the action to a fully plastic action similar to that of a digital piano. And apparently it plays more like a digital piano, which you know some people might not mind. But also the key pins uh, that uh, keep the keys in place were changed to plastic, and these are known to break. Another uh, bad thing about those is that they have the infamous white tape pickups that I mentioned before. And um, as the name implies, you can, you can point these out by their uh, white tape covering. And basically, these are known to go bad over time if they're subjected to a damp environment. And um, I've seen several posts on forums online where people have had to replace like a huge amount of them. So... Basically, I think your most cost-effective uh, purchase is those ones I mentioned. Um, also, the Mark V, I guess, is in a whole other category. Uh, although it, it has been acclaimed as like the best roads, I would think that if you're looking to purchase this, you're going to be spending a heck of a lot more money. I think the parts are also somewhat harder to find, and um, you know there is not as much information on maintenance although it is probably very similar to these ones but um, that's I think more of like a specialty instrument and not something that either you know a first time buyer or someone who's not looking to spend a couple thousand bucks would be looking at so that's why I recommend the models that I said and I just wanted to let you know that before I get any farther into this section so so let's say that you're looking to purchase a Rhodes what are some things that you should look for well, uh, I'm going to give you some things that I look for when I am looking to purchase the roads. The first thing I wanted to say is that if you're in the U.S., I think the best place to look for roads is on Craigslist. And there's two reasons. In my experience, uh, roads are usually a lot cheaper on Craigslist than they are if they were in, say, a local guitar center or music shop. And I know that this might not be true in all areas of the U.S., but at least around here, they're usually significantly less if you buy them from a private seller versus a shop. Um, the other thing is that usually when you're searching Craigslist, you're searching local ads, so you're not going to have to deal with shipping costs. And um, for an instrument that is as big and heavy as this, they would probably be, uh, you know, very, very expensive. Um, so... Those are the two main reasons that I personally use Craigslist. Um, now, if you're looking for a absolutely beautiful, fully restored Rhodes, um, Craigslist is probably not the place to look for that. But there are a couple of places around the U.S. that um, f restore them and sell them. Vintage Vibe is one of them, and um, you can check out their sites. But I'm just assuming that you are looking for a decent condition playable, possibly giggable roads, and um, under that assumption, I think that Craigslist is your best bet. Um, so once you have found a roads that you think is a good buy or looks good, 
and you're interested in it, um, and you found out whether or not it is a stage or suitcase, start to think of some questions to ask the seller based on maybe some of the pictures or information that they've given you. Um, personally, if it's a stage piano, I always ask whether or not it has the legs, crossbars, and the sustain pedal because on a lot of stages, uh, these things have gotten lost over the 30, 40 years that it's been since they've been produced. So that's not necessarily to say that if it doesn't have those, it's a deal breaker, but I would definitely use that as a bartering tool. Um, if it's a suitcase piano, ask if the electronics work. You know, does the amplifier output? Does the cable, is it scratchy? Does it work? Are the controls good? Um, because that could be just more added cost to your initial um, purchase price. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I ask is if all the keys play, are there any parts missing? Does it have the suitcase top? Um, I've purchased one without a suitcase top, but uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that just because it's harder to transport. Um, and I also think that um, you should, if there is anything wrong with it, uh, like say missing parts, use all this stuff to your advantage. Use it as a, a bargaining tool. Um, now, I wanted to give you my estimates in cost. Um, again, this is not necessarily a fully restored or um, absolutely mint condition instrument that I'm talking about, but for your average roads, I've seen them range, um, at least for the stage piano, between four and twelve hundred bucks on Craigslist. And a four hundred dollar instrument is probably going to be one that needs some work. It might be missing the sustain pedal or the legs or, or some parts like that. Um, and then twelve hundred dollars, it should be like in very, very nice condition. All the keys play, no issues. Um, and then for the suitcase, uh, the cheapest I've seen around here is about 600 bucks, and uh, those can go up to maybe like 15 or so. And the cheaper ones, like the uh, stage piano, will probably need some work. Um, it might be electronics or something to do with the action, stuff like that. And then the more expensive ones are going to be in obviously better condition. Um, so... I wanted to then uh, go into some of the things that you should look at when you are actually going out and testing the instrument. Okay, so if it's a stage piano like this one, play all the keys, make sure they all sound good. Um, make sure this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you know, see if the pots are scratchy. Um, make sure that the output works. And um, I always take a look at the Tolex, see if it's in good condition. This is not necessarily the end of the world if it's all torn up, but um, it's just going to be added cost if you want to replace it, and it's not an easy task. Um, and then if it does come with the sustain pedal, uh, test that out. I mean, it's a really simple system, so there's really not a whole lot that can break. Um, and then if it's a suitcase, make sure that the amplifier is working. Try the vibrato. Try all the sliders or knobs that are on the front and um, make sure that, you know, the cable, it's going to be either a five or four pin DIN cable. Make sure that that works. Um, and just like the stage, you know, play all your keys. Um, and then uh, just look at the overall condition of the instrument. And if you do find anything wrong, again, use it as a bargaining tool. Um, now I'm going to take the top off and I'll give you a look inside and tell you some things that I look for when I am looking to purchase one. So, <clears throat> Okay, so I've got the harp cover off now, and I just wanted to go over a couple of things I always check for underneath. Um, first of all, make sure that the tone bars are pretty free of corrosion. Make sure that it's generally pretty clean underneath. Um, if you see any sort of corrosion, whether it be on the tone bars or other metal bits, that's probably a sign that you should not buy the instrument because it's been in some sort of damp environment at some point. Um, the other thing I look at, uh, if a note isn't playing, there's three culprits. It could be a busted tine, it could be a bad pickup, or it could be a, a tuning spring that has gone missing. And basically I just try to look down and see if there is a tine there still. Um, and then, you know, go from there. If, it, if the tine is broken, well, then 
obviously you need to replace it. But if the tine's still there and it's clearly vibrating, there's a tuning spring on it and nothing's coming out, that's probably a dead pickup. Um, the other thing, if it doesn't have a tuning spring, especially on these higher register notes up here, uh, you, sometimes it, it just won't play. So um, those are a couple things I would check. Uh, the last thing, I always look at my serial number uh, model name sticker here to make sure that the model name actually matches the instrument that I'm looking at because I've seen several instruments where it might say suitcase piano on the sticker but it's actually a stage piano so I would definitely question the owner if those don't match because you know he might know why it's like that or you could have just found an instrument that someone is trying to like cobble together parts from a bunch of different roads uh, not to say that that means that it's bad but you know I don't know I'd be wary of it for sure um, so th that's really about it as, as long as it looks pretty clean and you don't find anything too corroded or um, broken you should be in pretty good shape um, so that's it for the inside all right, guys, so that was it for my buying tips. And in fact, that's it for this video review. I hope you enjoyed it. And I know that because there was so much material I went over in this video that some of you Eagle Eye viewers might uh, have noticed either some uh, mistakes or have some additional information that I might have uh, missed when I was doing this review. So if you have any comments, criticisms, or additional information, feel free to comment below and I want to reiterate that uh, community involvement is very important to us uh, we really want to hear from you guys so we can continuously uh, improve our videos so subscribe comment follow us on Twitter our handle is at audio tech VR and um, thanks for watching